hello everyone thank you for joining us today for another exciting episode of africa careful in today's episode we will be talking about social justice in post-apartheid south africa a little secret about this episode was that it was actually recorded last year when miss jabalili visited the university of houston to give a guest lecture after her lecture we were able to sit down to talk about some of the issues So now that the secret is out of the bag, let us start over again. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Africa Careful. Um, Today's episode, I have a guest with me here, and uh, Ms. Jabulele Butelezi. She's from South Africa. She's, uh, what are you, an author, (laughs) a journalist? Um, What do you do? So thanks for having me, Lucien. Uh, My name is Jabulele Butelezi from South Africa, and uh, I'm a writer and a social justice activist. So what sort of stuff do you write? So I write a lot about Africa's development, uh, youth leadership, uh, illicit financial flows, and basically just like many other issues that have a lot to do with human rights and Africa's social justice. So that means that you're pretty much writing about, I guess, everyday chaos that happens in Africa. Everyday headaches, everyday chaos. Uh, across our continent, yes. So then what do you mean by you also a social what? Social justice person, is that what you yeah. said? So what does that mean? Is that like, oh, because I know one of the things that we're very good for is we we are good at protesting, but we're never good at going <laughs> to the polls and changing leaders, but That's we're true. good at protesting. That's true. So I guess a part of this being a social justice activist is perhaps to take the voice on not just on the streets, but to sort of try and change the narrative try and influence futures, possible futures, trying to uh, influence mindsets and just like a social construct around quite a number of issues. When did you become involved in social justice? So I think it was inspired mostly by my work as a journalist. I trained as a journalist initially and um, I mean, you know, working as a reporter over the years, even though I didn't stay much in the traditional media, I saw a lot of injustice because of the number of stories that I write, you know, obviously for, for print media. So I think my love for, you know, fighting for human, for, for human rights, fighting for justice has always been very alert and alive because of what I would see and some of the stories I would come across. But it has certainly grown a whole lot more over the years. Um, even when I got into corporate, uh, when I started experiencing and literally seeing some of the injustices in in corporate South Africa and just generally as I kind of uh, moved on growing up around life you you get to see so many things that are wrong um, that are that do upset you and uh, you know I mean being the person that I am I I use the power of the pen to try and uh, just navigate through those social constructs. Yeah so um, this is interesting Uh, one of the things that I've always been interested in is that does I know newspaper and print media is big in Africa. For example, growing up, we used to have, you know, the downtown of the town that I grew up in. There was Mm -hmm. this shop where, or this area where they always sold newspaper. And it was always like the highlight of the morning. People run down there to buy the paper, to be able to read, Mm -hmm. to understand uh, what's happening during the day. But does that really make a difference besides people just wanting to be involved? And how does newspaper, you know, activism work yeah. in Africa? You know, surprisingly, it's still huge. <laughs> I myself, I'm still a fan of actually buying newspapers. I mean, people don't use newspapers as often. And if they do access newspapers, it's often through digital. So people use their iPads. Yeah. Uh, I'm one of those people. But I still feel the need to go and pick up a newspaper, especially on Sunday, because not all stories are, are on digital anyway. But um, there's a debate, obviously, right now about print media perhaps dying, but I mean, it's still pretty much alive, um, you know, and it's still growing, uh, particularly in not just in South Africa. In South Africa, it's still very strong, though, of course, not as strong as it was about five years ago. Um, but if you look at uh, some of the co- part of the continents like um, Kenya, for example, I've been there at some point. Print is massive. Yeah. And, and they've got like a very vibrant digital sort of... Um, what uh, society but print is is rife so print i think p- uh, particularly in the african context it's still pretty much going to be around for some time and it's still relevant because there are those loyalists who still prefer their stories on a newspaper yeah especially yeah. those grandpas and uncles who exactly. always send you to go buy them newspaper yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, so let's talk about South Africa. Um, South Africa has a very interesting story, especially for those of us who are Africans, because we've heard about South Africa a lot in the news based on one, you know, the racial injustice that happened in South Africa, apartheid and stuff. But more recently, South Africa has been in the news, and sadly, it's never, it, it wasn't a good thing for being in the news. It was about, you know, apartheid and um, not apartheid, but more or less xenophobia. Yeah. So, I mean, what does that involve? I mean, what does that entail for those who might not understand what xenophobia is? Yeah, oh, that's not my favorite story. So we certainly have been hitting the news, I mean, for all the wrong reasons, absolutely. We are known to be such a, a liberated country post-apartheid, where the rest of the continent rallied behind us during the apartheid regime. Some of the comrades uh, of the liberation movement at the time were even taken in to exile in various parts, you know, for example, Tanzania and all of that, and, you know, for training and, and that sort of thing. Essentially, during the apartheid regime, certain parts of the continent were, were very much uh, inclusive and supportive of South Africa and what we were going through at the time. I mean, I wasn't there, but history records this, that we were very welcomed uh, by, you know, the continent as a whole. So it's been quite saddening to see the rapidly changing sort of narrative of South Africa in particular when it comes to xenophobia. Uh, and it's not just new. I mean, of course, right now it's really just the peak of South African news, unfortunately. But um, this has started, I think, from even way beyond 2008. I think 2008, it's just when it really became so sort of dominant and, and pretty expressive, you know, in terms of violence. But I think the mindset, uh, the social contract construct of uh, illegal migrants or just foreign nationals has been it's sort of one of those things that lies dominant in South Africa. And I think South Africans have perhaps reached a point where, sadly, they are reacting in a way that is not necessarily uh, human which is quite sad because uh, we, we are one of those countries to also be known to be upholding the famous Ubuntu sort of, uh, yeah. you know, essence. But we, we certainly haven't been displaying that. And I mean, a number of issues um, are reason to this, a number of them. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting because you bring up this Ubuntu concept where, I mean, I know that, you know, South Africans take pride in that word, is it that I am because you are, that kind mm. of a stuff. But it's sad. I mean, I, this is maybe a philosophical question per se, but, are, you know, are, are people just inherently or just people just have this tendency to be hateful of one another? Because you look at South Africa. You had apartheid stuff. It was that, oh, the minority white population was mm -hmm. oppressing the majority black population. But now the black majority has power mm -hmm. and it's like, no, they want to oppress fellow blacks yeah. and, you know, foreigners in the country. Yeah. You know, again, it's, it's quite unfortunate. So, um, I mean, the current, perhaps I should start it off by saying, I mean, there's a range of inequalities in the country and, um, there's high unemployment rate, for example, which has grown significantly over the past two, three years. So you're saying that the xenophobic attacks are as a result of inequality? Um, I wouldn't say entirely. I really do think that it's a But what sort of inequality? I mean, because, I mean, the, the black majority is in power now. So, I mean, yeah. what kind of inequality are we talking about? So if they are controlling government. Yeah, oh, but it's, it's a huge, I mean, it's an issue. So, I mean, the black majority is in power right now um, as a ruling party. But governance is, is still a bit of a mess in South Africa. It's not as ideal as we would have hoped. And uh, inequalities, even though they are existing, they still are not a reason why people should be xenophobic towards fellow Africans. And I think this is the narrative we need to be very careful about. We do not dispute the fact that South Africa is going through a, a difficult economic season or climate at the, at the moment, um, where essentially there's almost like a fight for resources and there's very limited resources, high youth unemployment, uh, you know, just generally SMMEs not doing so good, which are essentially drivers of the economy because they, they contribute quite significantly to the GDP of the country as well, because they are almost like catalysts that create employment that assists the, the growth of, of the actual, uh, you know, economy of the country. So quite a number of pillars aren't as balanced as we would have loved them to be. But of course, uh, 
this is not the reason why we need to be hostile towards other Africans, fellow Africans who are living within our country. Just by the way, you know, from a legal point of view, they too have rights. So people might not necessarily co uh, come from South Africa or being South Africans in South Africa, but they too have, there's refugee rights, uh, there's static laws and, and policies that uh, somewhat protects them as well as Africans in whatever part of the continent. Yeah, but a lot of these blacks that have been attacked, I mean, from what I we've seen or I've read in the news, they're mostly West Africans, you know, yeah. I, and it, to me, it hurts me a lot because as a West African, I, I see my fellow West Africans being killed around. Mm. And when you think about South Africa uh, as a country, we think about apartheid movement, you know, it's funny because during apartheid, they were calling the rest of us comrades because mm. we're supporting their cause. Mm. But now it's like we have now become enemies. You know, yeah, we've become enemies. Yeah. It's like now we're the ones who are being oppressed in this country. That's true. Is unemployment really the only reason for this? No, certainly not. Unemployment is not. In fact, all the social ills that you can think of, particularly uh, in terms of inequality, I mean, lack of basic services, lack of proper governance, huge corruption in, within the government, which is an issue. And this upsets a lot of South Africans. All these are elements of an ill system. But none of these factors actually drive or should drive anybody to be hostile towards anyone else. So I do think that we need to be honest about the conversation of xenophobia and really tackle the social construct of self-hate, um, how people see another black or fellow you know, African. And we do know that as South Africans, and this is the truth that South Africans alone must have, that they are hostile towards other fellow Africans. Um, and, and this needs to change as it starts from Number one, just limited understanding of, of perhaps, you know, Pan-Africanism, if you like, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not a fan of Pan-Africanism, but that's a story for a different day. But this whole idea of South Africans need to know the history. Mm. I mean, to me, it is still very surprising. South Africa knew what they went through. The ANC, I think, is empowered to be able to inform the people and... and and apartheid is not something that happened 300 years ago. Mm -hmm. Some of us were born, you know, during that time when this was, you know, I guess it was towards the later years, but mm -hmm. some of us still have first-hand experience to it. So this is not some kind of ancient gone, story. yeah, ancient <laughs> story, forgotten narrative that, oh, yeah, this used to happen back in the day. So I'm surprised that the same people who were being oppressed are the same ones now perpetuating, you know, this sort of... um evil against fellow Africans. So, I mean, I don't know. What is it that the ANC is doing since they're the majority government? What is it that the rest of the political parties are doing since South Africa is being hailed now as is, what is it, rainbow nation, yeah. you know, narrative? What is it that they are doing? What is it that, they, you know, what's happening? What are the local people doing to try to be able to help so that such news or such, in, you know, incidents don't happen again yeah. in the future? So, I mean, it's funny how you mentioned Rainbow Nation. As much as you're not a fan of Pan-Africanism, I too am not a fan of Rainbow Nation. I think that's a complete <laughs> fallacy. Um, but for the purpose of social coercion, we kind of rally behind certain sort of narratives to try and build a better future and kind of try to educate the younger ones coming after us to perhaps try to begin teaching them about possible um, you know, futures of coexistence and tolerance and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but I think Rainbow Nation is something that still needs a huge uh, sort of work as a project. I think it's completely failed, primarily because, uh, I mean, South Africa is still very much uh, racist by its nature, uh, very hidden. I mean, you get into corporate, you still have white minority uh, rule. You, you've got a, a huge, massive issue that is like a big elephant in the room of white monopoly capital that nobody wants to address, even when in, in relation to xenophobia. The fact that you want to be xenophobic as a South African, but you're targeting an African, but you fail to, you know, extend this, a similar attitude to somebody who's from the US or who's from China, who is not South African, but is trading and essentially is, you know, conducting business in South Africa, who in fact, is the one taking the jobs, but not just taking the jobs, is effectively contributing to economic activity because they get to employ a very large population. So for me, it's one of those learnings in terms of understanding history and, and economic dynamics that affect inequality and just um, affect the, the profile of how we see South Africa because you cannot be xenophobic towards an African person and leave people who are not South African who are not black but they're not South African and they actually are quite involved in, in um, you know, in, in economic activity. So we, we do need to 
teach South Africans about perhaps for me it's more of a, a moral behavioral thing than anything else really so who is what do you think is equipped to do this teaching you know i would love to say the government but as a south african i hate pinning anything to my government because they do very little and that's the truth i mean they've got strides they've made and they talk about you know telling a good story or having a good story to tell which is fine i mean that that's what they think after all we've got it's about 25 years now of democracy but i do feel that this is a project that has to be something that starts with self so people like yeah. you know activists basically civil society has to spearhead a project of humanity because effectively this is what we have been shown to not be having we not advancing humanity instead we killing it and we make excuses about not being employed and not having this and not you know lacking resources when really we you know in simple terms it's like we lack manners so um, i mean this is i mean this is interesting on the level of that employment what is it as south africa what is the education level yeah. because it's one thing for employment it's one thing for underemployment but i mean is it that we have a bunch of educated people out there with no jobs or there and there are no yeah. means for them to even create their, you know their own employment yeah so so this is what it's at the root of the matter then yeah but again not entirely so it's a part of it um in fact you know mo- the majority of unemployed south africans are actually graduates which is a very painful story but you look at the same coin and you flip it around these are not necessarily people who are busy with looting and you know busy with all these barbaric acts so again there's two ties to it so somebody is out there looting and behaving in the worst manner but you get a very civilized perhaps you know person who is in their home who might not necessarily be looting but essentially holds the same views uh, and to me those people are the same because you might not be out there looting but you in your house referring to other foreign nationals or non south africans with names. so that means that if i get this correctly the people that are i guess like champions like if we want to use the word of these xenophobic attacks are not necessarily the ones that are educated and unemployed but more or less you know we, we call them i used to call them in west africa the area boys those that are in you know at home the uneducated and you know the ones that are just gallivanting and yeah. hanging around the you know the streets and stuff like that i mean i would i'd beg to defy a bit there because you know i I, look, I stand to be corrected, but I do feel like that there's greater forces behind. So I do feel like there are people who are educated who are behind. So I mean, <laughs> if I so you're trying to say that maybe they're like sponsored by some. Yep, that's, that's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> I do feel that there's uh, there are forces. No, but high but level to forces. what good though? To what good would I serve by them? Because if you know, to think that if they're sponsored, maybe if we say you know somebody in power mm-hmm. i mean th- that in itself just negates the entire story of south africa yeah where the whole of africa rally behind you to help support that you know i remember when mandela left prison you know he had his grand tour of africa visiting one country mm. after another for and thanking them for all of their support yeah and then now the same people were trying to liberate turn around on the rest of us yeah i mean this is interesting and i want to contrast this with um uh with Rwanda for example mm-hmm. because in 1994 the same time apartheid was ending the you know the 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 genocide, the genocide in uh, in Rwanda was coming to an end at the same time but then we're 25 years now into the future we don't see you know those sort of news coming out of Rwanda mm-hmm. i mean what hap- is it that south africans need to, i mean what has, what happened in Rwanda that mm-hmm. you know it did not happen in south africa i yeah. mean what is it that we can You know why is South Africa taking a different path and Rwanda is on a different path? Yeah, I mean those are interesting, you know, parallels. Um I love the Rwandan story. I I really love how they have been able to bring themselves to a resolve as a country, as a people, and I do think that we actually should be learning from Rwanda. Um but I also do think that the political climate in South Africa has somewhat changed to become what we might not have necessarily wanted i mean we now have the facet of uh coalitions now which are pretty much dominant in the picture of south african politics politics which is good because this perhaps is one of the elements that showcase a very alive and alert democracy which is good but at the same time 
we are having the ruling party that it has some the truth is it's not as united and that's the truth we all know we we love them but we also know that they're not doing a great job because it's like running two houses from one you know um, and i think this perhaps could be at the root of why things are falling on the, between the cracks because i mean the issue of xenophobia for example even if you were to not necessarily advance the argument of it's being sponsored or not the fact that as a ruling party you're unable to put a hold on it with xenophobic attacks uh just sporadically spread across you know starting from Pretoria to Johannesburg within 2 days 48 hours up, up until perhaps day 4 day 3 and you are not able to to put a hold on it as the government that for me is a, is a huge issue i mean okay i mean there there's there are two points that i want to probably to try to understand okay you know back to rwanda there's something that south africans could learn from rwanda um i know that during uh during the Rwandan genocide when things were coming to an end they had all these you know public courts and so on and so forth and you know sometimes public shaming of people people yeah. were locked up in jail some people served terms South Africa had the same thing this truth and reconciliation commission but a lot of it was most they always forgive people let's move on you know do you think that that is one of the reasons why South Africans haven't healed where it, it becomes a well we were you know if it was done to us now we're just going to find maybe the weakest link with who are the immigrants and the sojourners yep. that have come into our place and we're just going to you know do the same thing to them i mean if people had been locked up in prison as a result of apartheid and stuff would there have been a good deterrent i guess for the people so that you know whether it's white on black or black on black hate will not you know i guess perpetuate mm-hmm. itself like this Yeah, I think I may have to just agree with you there, but I think they 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 should have been I mean, look, the the truth and reconciliation for me is not really something to go to town about. I feel like there was in and of itself there was so much injustice just in that regard because I feel like we black people were forced to be in a very compromising, very vulnerable position which I feel number one was very premature because it was a government orchestrated event or era which I mean I don't think some people were really ready at that time to have that kind of face to face but you know it's almost like a tick box it's done great i suppose you you can't completely sort of dispel it from the contribution it has made towards building the rainbow nation as they put it but i do feel like we should have seen more significant uh, results where we we do people actually do see people go to jail i mean apartheid was deemed as a crime against humanity by united nations and this is exactly the issue with just our continent as a whole people get away with the wrong things but nothing happens and this is precisely why at the at the height of xenophobia in south africa we've got a um, massive issues with corruption and still nobody is going to jail nobody is being held accountable in fact we've got endless commissions sitting inquiring and inquiring with no form of any tangible result in terms of what is the resolve and what how will this affect or influence governance of the country so that it advances itself beyond the narrative of corruption so i do feel that you know the truth and reconciliation we i don't think we need to be proud about about that and how and the work it has done it was great but and also all the parties that were involved faith based people and that sort of yeah. thing but i do feel like it's something that was so premature it it it's great it happened but the truth is that we remain an angry nation and that is a fact that south africans alone they need to accept this all of us have to accept that we are angry so but what what were you angry at i mean are you angry at your fellow africans or i mean i still because that is something mm. that i'm you know i don't get you know south africa i've been there you know met a lot of nice people you know had good conversations with folks but is that okay one they're angry two you mentioned the fact that the second point was two you mentioned the fact that the government cannot contain mm-hmm. this stuff i mean what how how would it, how would the government contain this is it by locking up people is it by having these tribal councils you know talking you know to people to try to you know help the situation mm. because this doesn't make sense right year in year out we have these xenophobic attacks mm-hmm. you know they've happened this year we're going to take a pause in two years again there's going to be an uprising for the same thing yeah so, and and that's that's a problem we cannot that's not the kind of south africa we should be and and you see that is quite frustrating because we have a government in power and there's a reason why they are elected into office they are meant to contain and control things like this you cannot talk about advancing 
economic interest and appetite in South Africa and travel across the world to go and pitch your ideas and talk about how beautiful South Africa as a country is and that people must come and invest in it when, when the house is really a mess. So, but then how does the government contain such an issue? I mean, to contain such an issue, I mean, how? Do you just lock up people? I mean, locking up people would not solve the problem. Yeah, it might not solve the problem, but at least, I mean, I can, I can never attempt to speak on behalf of the government, but I, if I were to suggest to them, I would at least sort of urge them to be a bit more bold in their actions. I mean, xenophobia has criminal elements too, and that for me, th those are basics. But really, you know, to, to talk about reports of so many people arrested, so many, we don't even know what has happened to people who are arrested. Xenophobia was at its height, I think about, is it four weeks ago or so? And we had a report of about 300, 600 or so people arrested. I don't even know what has happened to those people. Are they released? Did they get bail? It's like a joke. You know, you need to have some sustainable measures to, to handle this. So you're good. saying that a solution will be to have some kind of a tribunal, like, you know, Rwanda had, and then, you know, try these people, maybe put, make it on TV, more probably, you know, broadcast it so that the, the masses can see what's happening and punish them. So maybe doing that publicly will have some element of public shaming and might be some sort of a deterrent for people to be able to continue doing such an act. Well, I think before we get into those, you know, sort of practicals, for me, we, we need to even start with our ministers and our political uh, figures, because their rhetoric is completely out of order. We have ministers, for example, Minister of Home Affairs, who really is known to be, you know, uttering some of the most unfortunate remarks. And, and as much as they need to make their points, when you actually go down to uh, the stats, stats essay, and you look at the number of migrants coming in, the number of migrants who access public health systems, uh, the number of migrants employed within the economic system in, in various sectors across the country, low level, high level, and that sort of thing. They don't even make up to 2.5 percent of the population. So my 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 issue is with the narrative of under, you know, it's a it's almost like a fallacy that's just thriving on lies. And this for me is a, is a huge issue because for people who have survived apartheid, we should be knowing better in terms of understanding our historical legacy and thereby understanding the facts of our country. People who are in the country, you know, perhaps those who are illegal, then by all means, you know, you go to any country, you abide by. I mean, that's a simple narrative. You get into any country, you've got to do the legal stuff, do what the Romans do. Fair enough. That's yeah. very simple. But I have an issue with people who are there in, you know, participating economically, who have the right papers. Why should we be known to be harassing people who, like any other person who could be living in the US or the UK or even South Africans for that matter, who some are minors in Congo, in Zambia and, and so forth. So for me, the, that's the small thinking I am grappling with. But I do think that before we even begin to terrorize our, you know, our people with trying to educate them about understanding race, I mean, not even race relations, but just humanity and, and tolerance. We need to deal with the, with the leaders because their rhetoric is not helpful at all. Wow, that's interesting that, you know, the, the stuff coming from the leaders, the people who elected and entrusted them with power is not helping. Um, so, I mean, to, to try to wrap this up, what sort of solutions, you know, um, can help solve this problem for South Africa? Because it's pretty sad, you know, you, I guess, I mean, what are other entities doing? You have folks like the African Union, right? They, they're saying all this stuff. What is the South African economic whatever community and so on and so forth. What are they doing to try to help, uh, you know, solve this issue? Because maybe if we don't elevate this to some kind of a crisis, if South Africa doesn't mm -hmm. begin to get embargoes maybe that's a solution to help if south africa if if the rest of africa says well we're not going to trade with you mm -hmm. and do business with you all that kind of stuff will such solutions help or you know what are some things that can be done and what are some things that south africans should you know start to think about yes i mean so i do think as a country we need to really focus on growing our economy number one so that when we talk about people taking our jobs we're not spreading lies because that's that is half truth so we do need to focus on building that economy and just growing the actual economy because it, it's been quite uh, uncertain, I mean, sort of volatile as well. But I also think we need to have a very robust strategy towards crime prevention and just avoidance. Um, we blame foreign nationals for crime. Again, you know, 
I'm again not disputing the fact that yes, we do have Nigerians who sell drugs, but that I don't even like saying this myself because we do have South Africans selling drugs in El Dorado Park too. Yeah. And I mean, you know, just on a lighter note, during the week when we had xenophobia, I had said a joke to a friend and said, perhaps the South Africans in El Dorado Park this particular week have made so much money because nobody's focusing on you now. <laughs> so you might have made so much profit selling drugs because this focus is not on you. You see, for me, we, we need to be very clinical with some of the narratives that we advance. So I do feel that we need to come up with a very robust strategy towards our crime prevention in the country, which is known to be, I mean, it's not terrible. You know, South Africa, again, we are being looked at as the beacon of hope, perhaps because of the const our type of constitution. But that, again, is not even holding water anymore. We need to yeah. do something beyond that. People can't be looking at at us and admiring us for our constitution. We need to be actively uh, be seen to be trying to uh, advance better lives. But I also feel like as a country, we our, our crime is levels are, are very high. I mean, you just look at it, how South African women are, are, are being killed. Femicide in South Africa is like a it's like a nightmare, you know. And th these are not uh, you know foreign nationals killing and raping women and children in, in South Africa. It's South African men mostly, according to the stats, as you yeah. know. So we. The truth is, we need to clean our house, and we have a lot of problems ourselves. Inequality, particularly in South Africa, is a problem. Um, it's not something you solve over over a night. And we understand that they've had a difficult twenty five years trying to reconstruct a sexist uh, colonial sort of architecture, which is very systematic and deeply rooted even today. But you, I always say, this is why you're the man with the job. You need to make it work. You need to find ways to make sure that you make it work. I see. So there's lots of stuff that the government has to do. Again, you know, fix, clean the house, create, you know, an environment that is, you know, going to be conducive for, I, I guess, job creation. Maybe that's policy changes. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, one last thing on this, what are uh, faith-based organizations doing? Because, you know, there's this whole narrative of that, you know, it's that South Africans are hateful. Mm -hmm. And we know that when we look at the stories of Rwanda, people who... You know, faith-based organizations were able to help those who, you know, killed, you know, brought, killed other people's relatives, able to forgive them, accept them, change them, rehabilitate them, and put them back into society. And now they are, some of them are productive citizens and all of that stuff. I mean, what are there any things that faith-based organizations are doing to help in this stuff? I mean, it's easy for us to always blame the government. Yeah. But this, you know, what are the, what are they doing? And other charity organizations, what are they doing? So NGOs are pretty vocal about injustices generally across the society, which is great. They do amazing work together with civil society there. And I think that voice needs to be protected because that's almost like the conscience of, of a society. Government, I will not talk about them for now because we, you know, we look up to them and they, they make us upset all the time. Um, but I do want to just park a little bit on faith, faith nominations in, during the apartheid regime. This particular sector was very uh, instrumental in shaping social coercion, in, in mediating talks between two groups. It wasn't easy, but they were very focal, and their role was quite significant and quite respected. And I know that there's a you know council of churches right now, even in South Africa, which some churches don't belong to, some belong to, but are, they're just mere observers. It's uh, quite an issue in and of itself, in a way in terms of why other parties are involved, some are not based on their doctrines and whatnot. However, the, the structure is there and it does try, but often I find them to be quite reactive. They, they're very reactionary to everything that happens. So that's not helpful either. But I do, I do think that they've got room to make change and play their role because, um, there's quite a lot of people. I mean, Chris, you know, there's quite a lot of people who look up to those structures. Uh, Christianity is just as rampant in South Africa as anywhere else. So, you know, those uh, leaders in, in religious institutions need to really step up and uh, help in, in, in building social cohesion. And it starts with the education of humanity, safeguarding humanity, um, safeguarding Ubuntu. You know, I have actually said to South Africans at some point, perhaps we need to pause a little bit talking about it for now until we're able to be a little bit more humane towards other people. So I think everyone has a role to play, but more significantly, religious-based institutions, they are being undermined now. It's as if their voice doesn't matter, but perhaps it could be that um, shining sort of lighthouse be at right now because clearly, you know, there's a gap. Any parting words for us as we, you know, 
you know, think about these xenophobic attacks in South Africa and think about South Africa as a whole, what is it that, what would you as a South African tell the rest of the African community? Yeah, well, first of all, I mean, I'd probably join my president with his apology sort of roadshows <laughs> and say I apologize not on behalf of South Africans. I don't speak for everybody else, but I speak for myself, perhaps, you know, just candidly. But I do want to say that, you know, it's also not a picture that's painted holistically, you know, also what we should also guard against social media, which get, gets to perpetuate sometimes even false information. But the truth is we can't deny that I've met friends who are not from South Africa who are pretty concerned because the, the, the situation is, is not favorable and we, we cannot uh, operate in that it's, a, it's an issue. So I think we need to know that perhaps what I would tell Africans is that Let's keep that hope alive. We, I mean, I don't think there's a, an African who is a, a foreigner in Africa. I think that's just ridiculous narrative. So I think we need to keep keep the the hope alive and uh, try to unite and uh, not give up on each other yet. You know, the road is still long, but I do feel that we we can we can get there at some point. Thank you very much, and uh, we hope that you continue to advocate for the rest of us in South Africa. Yeah, thanks a lot for having cool. me. Thank you very much, Jabulele, for sharing your thoughts with us. Ms. Jabulele is now back at home where she continues to lead the charge. She also recently started a millennial dialogue on Africa. You can check them out on Facebook. I leave you with this one question. What are you doing to voice the injustice around you? For many of us, it can become easy to just stay quiet and silent. Many times it can be easy for us to just relax and hope that the government or policies change. But in reality, we are the biggest change makers. For Jabulele, she found out early on and used the influence of her pen to write and to bring light to some of these issues. I hope that in our circle of influence, we are going to be those change makers and agents. Until next time. Thank you for joining us at the Carrefour.